So this is the first non solo oscillators we're going to discuss. It's a UJT sort of generator. So when you look at this diagram, there's a switch here, and we've got the R, E, and C, and uh, the UJT itself is this part here. And B1 and B2 are in the interbase resistances. And the output is taken through the emitter terminal, through the, the emitter terminal, whatever as the E terminal. So look at this. This is what we have as a UJT. So when this switch is closed, when this switch is closed, we establish a base current, the base current through B1 and B2. And at that time, the interbase current is established. The C capacitor charges. The C capacitor charges to maximum. So once it's charged to maximum, at the point it starts to discharge, the point starts to discharge, the UGT is now turned into saturation, it goes to the turn on moment because we shall increase this emitter voltage VD above the intrinsic standard of ratio and the emitter resistance. So let us recall that we have done this and when for us to, for the peak voltage or the voltage required to turn this must be greater than the peak voltage, which is the, the voltage drop across the diode, which is represented by E, and the interbase resistance transistor ratio. So the output is taken through the E terminal while VCC will give us the E, VE. And we remember that VE was discussed in a previous, that VE is supposed to be VD plus the intrinsic stand of ratio voltage. So that's this how it is. So we're going to do, try the, to, to discuss about the operation. So the first statement we have here is that when the switch is closed, When the switch is closed, a small current is established. Through a small current is established through the resistors R1 and R2 through the resistors R1 and R2. And at, and at the same time, and at the same time, capacitor C is charged. So when the capacitor voltage equals to the emitter voltage, equals to the emitter voltage, VA, the UJT is turned on, but I refer to a saturation. The UJT is turned on, and it becomes forward biased, and is forward biased. Hence, there is an output Recorded. Another statement is that at the start of the discharging of the capacitor, at the start of 
is charging of the capacitor. Through R1. At the start, we discharge the capacitor through R1. A discharge current, discharge current sets up. A discharge current sets up. the voltage through E B1 junction through E B1 junction and the resistor R1. So another statement we need to put here, there is that, which comes on last point, as the capacitor approaches zero, as the capacitor voltage approaches, as the capacitor voltage approaches zero. The junction, again, is reverse biased. It's reverse biased. And drives the UJT to a cut off. So this process is repeated for the next cycle. Multi vibrators. So we're going to start on a subtopic which is about was multi vibrators. Multi vibrators are two, two stage amplifiers with positive feedback. And uh, because of that positive feedback, the output of the amplifier, in other words, is, is able to, to be maintained at a, an, a certain amplitude that's constant. Another thing we need to understand is that uh, the feedback applied to this in these types of circuits is such that it's, it's, a, it's a positive going. In this case, is that the amplitude of the output of solutions is able to, to keep to be increased or maintained above, above certain limit, above certain limit, so that it doesn't go below that. So, and when it goes below that, automatically the system stand off. So, on the part of reduction, these are two stage amplifiers. Huh? This has two stage amplifiers with positive feedback. This has two stage amplifiers with the positive feedback from the output, the positive feedback from the output. So the feedback supplied. The feedback supplied. The feedback is supplied in a way that in a way that The transistor is driven into 
in a way that is is driven into saturation and cut off. So time, then we can have type, what I refer to as types of uh, multivibrators. So we normally have what I refer to as a stable. A stable multivibrators. So we're going to have it's there are basically three types. There's stable, there's a stable, monostable, and bistable, but we, we shall discuss them as we proceed on with the diagrams. So as stable, we're going to draw the diagram now so that we explain the operation of it and understand it from the diagram, which becomes very easy for us to be able to understand that. So uh, this is how the diagram appears in a stable multivibrator. One of the things we're going to realize is that uh, across the two ends, of the two collectors of the transmitters, we have the, the loads RL1 and RL2. And also across, in parallel with the RL1 is R2 and R1 respectively. So one of the things we are going to understand that when the switch is closed here, one of the transistor will be driven at saturation and the other one will be driven at cutoff. So suppose that the transistor Q1 is driven to saturation the meaning of saturation that it is conducting, eh? it is conducting, and the transistor L2 is at Q off. And during this point of conduction here, the VC1 here will be zero because there is no voltage drop. Once this driven saturation, when the switch is closed, we shall have the load conducting and going to the ground. So the VC1 will be at zero. But at that point, say, at that instant, Q2 is at cut off, and that means the voltage across here is at maximum VCC. So during that conduction, this transistor charges to maximum supply voltage, which is given by the CVCC. And um, when the switching takes place, when this now turns off and this turns on, we have a replication of this process being produced at the transistor Q2. When we produce at the transistor Q2, the output of the result is you'll have this kind of waveform that appears to be in the upper cutoff and the lower cutoff we have got that time. So this appears to be the, the, the first transistor, the scan, the first again, the scan transistor, Q1, Q2, Q1, Q2, repeatedly. So at the end of the process, this is what we shall be having as a as unstable. So the meaning of a stable is that we're going to be having two states. Either we have a positive signal, again, we have a negative signal. So it's keep on alternating that way. And that will talk of the stable part of it. So this is the diagram we are supposed to have. And to understand how this thing operates is very, very simple once to understand the components and how it's, it's done. So we are going to put down the operation. So the first statement is that during the operation, during the operation, Transistor Q1, the transistor Q1 is turned on while Q2 is turned off and vice. Another thing we need to understand that when power is switched on, one of the transistor saturates before the other. the other and initiates a feedback current that is responsible of 
for maintenance of oscillation. So suppose Q1 turns on. Suppose Q1 turns on and Q2 is at cut off. The voltage, the voltage across the transistor Q1 goes to minimum referred to as zero. Goes to minimum and the capacitor and the capacitor C1 charges to maximum to maximum voltage. At this instant, the transistor Q2 is at cut off and the voltage across it is at VCC, i.e. VC2 is equals to VCC. And that's it, but since a is at zero. Since A is at zero voltage, since A is at zero voltage, C2 starts to discharge. C2 starts to discharge through R2 towards VCC. Start to discharge through R2. Towards VCC. Towards VCC. So, when the voltage is sufficient enough it turns on it turns on transistor q2 and q1 is driven to cut So we are the last So when when Q two when Q one is cut off at Q two okay. V C two goes to zero. goes to minimum voltage zero 
while VC1 goes to VCC. V goes to VCC. And the potential across VC2, the, the potential across VC2 decreases. Potential across VC2 decreases. Decreases and C2 is charged. It's charged to VCC voltage. So this is the process that we need to understand and we are able now to know that uh, once this one of them turns on, the other one must go off. When this is on, then this capacitor is going to charge to maximum. So for when it starts discharging, uh, then the voltage across C2 is able to turn the Q2 into saturation. So we have an on-off, on-off situation that is repeated throughout because of the lack of stability. That's why I refer to it as a stable. It's changing every moment and then it's changing. So we're going to have a second type of multivibrator, which we refer to as maybe the monostable. So we're going to have the monostable and also draw the diagram immediately. So, this is a monostable by multivibrator, and uh, this is how the circuit appears. But there's a, there's a small difference from the monostable in that uh, the connection through the transistor Q1 is slightly different. But the rest appears to be like one in the A-stable position. So the, for us to understand this, we must know the initial conditions for this thing to operate so that it sets up a predetermined output before we now apply our pulse. So in the answers, in the, this is a pulse, this is a trigger pulse, this is a trigger pulse here. So in the explanation you need to understand before we apply this pulse and the, st the initial state is the switch is connected and there's no pulse here, what will be happening then? That's what I, I, I want us to, to understand. And the function of the VBB, which is on a negative voltage, then you should be able to know why this condition is. So this condition only applies on, on the upper part of the sine wave, and the lower part is totally cut off. And that cut off is maintained by this applied voltage. So when without a pulse here and the VCC switch is closed, eh, the transistor Q2 will be turned on, it goes into saturation. And the transistor goes into saturation, the voltage across point B here, or across Q2, we now go to v, V0. But at this point here, with that no pulse applied here, and this is a negative voltage, the transistor Q1 here is turned off, is at cut off permanently. It's until you apply a pulse, then things are going to change. But we shall see that in the next next stage or next level. So what happens is that we need to understand that the initial condition for us before we apply the trigger pulse, how does it exist? That's the essence of us having this diagram to explain first, and we are able to know that. So the, when we apply the initial condition, we shall have this one conducting through this resistor one, and we shall have the voltage across B or across, across capacitor Q2 to, to be zero while the voltage across the transistor Q1 to be at maximum. So when this one is conducting, remember the VCC will go, going to charge to maximum. C1 is going to charge to maximum, so, so that uh, this one is maintained at a saturation and this has maintained at a cut off using the VVB. So with the first statement, we need to have the initial condition. Initial condition. 
width with the switch closed and no pulse applied at C2. The transistor Q2 is saturated while Q1 is at cut off. So uh, the voltage V B B minus V B B and R one and one keeps the transistor keeps the transistor keeps the transistor Q one at cut off permanently. Then C1 will charge to capacitor C1. Charges to VCC. Charges to VCC. Charges to VCC through the resistor R2. Through the resistor RL. RL1, RL1. So we're going to study this when we now, now apply pulse, then what do we expect when this pulse is present? So it's very key that you also understand when the pulse is present, what are the changes that we expect and how the, the circuit is going to behave. So we're going to uh, go to another part of this situation when the trigger pulse is applied. So we are going to explain also this before we put down something. So we'll be looking at our diagram, looking at this diagram that we have here. When the trigger pulse is applied through C2, then Q1 is going to be turned on, but Q2 is going to be turned off. And when Q1 is turned off, the voltage ac across Q1 at point A and the ground goes to minima, while the voltage at point B with the ground across Q2 goes to maximum. And therefore, for the conduction part of it, the transistor now is able to conduct. And during this conduction, then you have the, the C, C1 discharging. C1, when C1 discharges, then it's able to, to maintain, it's able to maintain uh, the negative poten potential that is across this point, the negative position that's across the Q2. Because when discharging, it's giving us a negative voltage, which we've been faced with this one, and we're able to maintain the Q2 at the cut off stage. So basically, that's what happens. So when this pulse becomes greater enough for this to start conducting, then when this one starts conducting, we shall have a load flowing through this. And remember, when the voltage, when the pulse is greater enough, it must be greater than the VBB, so that this one stand on. And the starts stand on, then you shall have this path conducting through to Q2, Q1. And the voltage here is supposed to be zero. So yeah, that's basically what happens. 
B2, just be aware that when the pulse is applied, then this beam is going, is going to be triggered. And this is, goes to cough off, this goes to saturation. So we put down that. When a pulse is applied, through capacitor C2, through capacitor <coughs> C2, the transistor Q1 turns on, while Q2 while Q2 turns off. And then the operation of the circuit is as follows. So <coughs> number one, <coughs> With a positive pulse, with a positive pulse applied, with a positive pulse applied at C2, a positive pulse applied at C2, and if the pulse is of sufficient voltage the transistor Q1 is turned on is turned on while Q2 is driven to cut off. A kit is driven to cut off. <clears throat> so number two, when Q1 starts conducting, so as Q1 starts conducting, the voltage across the transistor Q1 goes to minimum. The voltage across transistor Q1 goes to minimum while the voltage across Q2 approaches approaches VCC approaches VCC so capacitor 1 <coughs> capacitor 1 is also discharges capacitor 1 also discharges through the resistor R2 to the load RL1. So, shall, uh, so the last part or the other uh, part you need to know is this. Uh, mm. 
the positive signal, the positive signal at point B. is fed through the positive signal point B is fed through R1 and biases the positive signal is fed through R1 and biases Q1. Positive signal is fed through R1 and biases R1 <coughs> and biases Q1 which it will versus Q1. And this results in increase in increased results in increased output signal. Increased output <coughs> signal. Increased output signal while the potential at point A remains at zero. So we want to now to establish how we are going to start the, the circuit, the initial condition, so that at, at the end of the process, we are at the same point we started from. Then how do we return the circuit to the initial condition? Huh? So as the voltage across transistor Q1 remains at zero volts, i.e. point A is at zero volts, capacitor C1 starts to discharge, starts to discharge through the transistor Q1. through the transistor Q1 to the ground. <coughs> so as C1 discharges, a negative voltage, a negative voltage is established it is established and drives the transistor Q2 to cut off it is established and drives eh? the transistor Q1 to cut off not Q2 drive the transistor Q2 to cut off. So the last point we shall have here is that as the as Q2 conducts further, as Q2 conducts further. the potential at point B, the negative going silicon, the negative going signal at point, negative going signal at point B through R1 drives Q1 into cutoff through R1 drives Q1 
into cut off. I'm going to cut off. Hence, returning the circuit to initial condition. <coughs> 